All right. Hello. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us today. My name is Josefina Chavarria. I'm the director of the Peace Accords Matrix at the Croc Institute, and it's a real pleasure to welcome all of you to this wonderful uh, afternoon, rainy afternoon, but with a lot of very interesting ideas. And welcoming back Roger McKinty to the University of Notre Dame. This is, of course, not the first time that Roger is here. So welcome back, Roger. We're so happy and delighted that you're visiting us again today. Um, you know that I, I really, uh, one of the reasons I very much enjoy our collaboration is because uh, Roger and Roy have wonderful titles for their project. So two cheers for ignorance. <laughs> I love that one. The multiple forms of microdynamic agency at work in conflict affected societies. Um, many of you are here because you've read uh, Roger McKinty's work. He is uh, famously, of course, the author of Everyday Peace, a book that we read uh, in many of our courses on peace and conflict studies. He's always been very interested in uh, studying the intersection of bottom-up and top-down approaches to peace building. And in this work, uh, he has created the Everyday Peace Indicators Project together with Pamina Fercho. She, um, also a very good old friend of the Croc Institute. Uh, he's also the editor of the Taylor and Francis Journal on Peace Building with Oliver Richmond. Um, he also edits the Rethinking Political Violence book series. And of course, he uh, he's very well known for articles that he has published in Cooperation and Conflict Security Dialogue and the Review of International Studies. Um, and today I'm very glad to hear uh, this newest update from this project uh, of the microdynamics of everyday intergroup encounters in Colombia, Lebanon, and Northern Ireland. I have seen this project develop from a proposal idea. I've heard many of the progress that they have made, and I'm really looking forward to today's talk where Roger is going to help us identify or share with us the identification and categorization of the everyday agency of people, how they are deploying in this post-accord context um, in a way that they're not just preventing a worsening of conflict, but that however, what the authors of the, and Roger today will share with us, these tactics may actually prolong situations of negative peace. Uh, so he's going to share with us some fundamental questions about the utility and purpose of peace building interventions in post-accord societies. Thank you, Roger, so much. Thank you for being here. Thank you. Hey, hello, everyone. Um, thank you very much for uh, coming. Um, I really only suggested that I would hop to Notre Dame um, because I was in Ohio to speak with my good friend um, Matt Half and that suddenly became would you give a paper and even more weirdly I'm going to class at 9 30 tomorrow morning with with Hunter graduates so uh <laughs> So I find my, myself here by, by accident, but thank you very much for, for coming. Um, and I particularly want to thank the Co Norton Institute for Irish Studies and, of course, the Croc Institute for International Peace Studies for extending the invitation. And it's extremely important in these days that we talk about peace. Uh, we can talk, and a lot of people do talk, about war and conflict and security. Um, but it's important that we also talk about peace. So I think this is a very important um, place on our planet. Okay, so for many years I've been um, writing about this concept of everyday peace, trying to work out what it means. Um, and many years ago I wrote a journal article trying to scope out conceptually what everyday peace meant. And I came up with a typology of social practices that were linked with everyday peace. 
things like avoidance, ambiguity, ritualized politeness. And it was very much the sort of um, article that a sedentary academic uh, writes from the comfort of their desk. I, and albeit I was reflecting on, on, on my upbringing uh, in Northern Ireland, but at the same time it was conceptual. And I was very much interested in having been trained to the extent that anyone who has a PhD from the UK is trained, but as someone who, who came from an international relations background and therefore was interested or used to looking at states and institutions, I was increasingly interested actually in the local, in tactical agency, in the small acts that we engage in, in terms of encounter between the in-group and the out-group in those social practices that people use uh, in everyday life. I was interested in the strategies used in encounter and how those conform to particular norms and how they were enacted and embodied in everyday life, in the most banal encounters in conflict-affected societies. Those encounters that we all I engage in, you know, whether we're taking the kids to school or we're going to the store or we, we're getting medicine for, for granny. Um, th those are uh, activities of encounter with other people, but of course that encounter matters in conflict-affected societies. And I became interested in, in the skill set that people had, this emotional intelligence, the ability to read a room, this hyper-social awareness in which people uh, could really, really gauge the temperature about what was permissible and what was impermissible in particular circumstances. And much of that was about timing. When is the time to be quiet? And when is the time uh, to speak? And I was interested very much in how the local received and resisted and endured um, top-down attempts to foster peace. Now, everything that, that we write is, I think, autobiogra autobiographical to some extent. And I come from Northern Ireland. I grew up during a, a bitter but actually low intensity civil war. It cannot be mentioned in the same breath uh, 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 as Ukraine or Yemen or Gaza or many other places. Uh, it, it, it was a very different sort of conflict, but at the same time, very Bitter. And Google is a wonderful thing. And I found these, these two photographs. This um, photograph, my, my parents were storekeepers. They had a store. And this was the street where their, their store was. Um, and when I became interested in this issue of the everyday and trying to process, how did my parents bring up six kids reasonably normally? You know. I, the reasonable uh, is there uh, for a purpose. But, you know, how did they do that? What were those strategies? What was the everyday diplomacy? How did they navigate life in a small town in which 50% of the population identified very differently um, politically uh, and, and in terms of, of uh, a religious identity? And then I discovered this other photograph. Um, and the photograph is significant from uh, because of the buildings in the background. That's actually my high school. And it, it abutted one of the busiest heliports in Western Europe. And because the roads were insecure for the police and the military because of IEDs, then the military would drop patrols, say 10 miles outside the town, and the patrols would walk in on foot. They couldn't use vehicles. So the background to my high school was was helicopters. And I reckon I probably have heard about 50% of my education. And only recently have I realized that the earth is round. I because I, I missed geography class that day. And you know, I, I, I saw all of this abuse towards flat earthers uh, on the internet. And I said, you know, what's wrong with that? But every day is a school day. The reason I, I put these here is, is to say that, you know, everyone is on some sort of intellectual journey. And I was actually trying to find out how did mom and dad do it? 
and the other moms and dads, I, both where I come from, but also in many other conflict affected societies. And in my case, of course, mom and dad weren't there to ask anymore. So I, I, I had to find other methods. So in a way, that's the, the sort of personal yet intellectual hinterland of um, where I'm coming from. Now, yes, well known, probably owes money in this parish. Uh, <laughs> um, so very fortunately, in collaboration with uh, Dr. Roddy Brett, who, who was here last year, um, we have been funded by the Economic uh, and Social Research Council in the UK uh, to investigate some of these, um, these questions. And our project is called Getting On With It, the Microdynamics of Social Relations in Conflict-Affected Societies. And we've been incredibly fortunate to work with two wonderful postdoctoral researchers, uh, Clara Vavoide Casabo, who's based at Bristol with Roddy, and Tia Sagarian Dickey, who, who works in, in Durham with me. This, is, this project is sadly coming to an end, um, but it, it's been great fun. And what I'm about to share with you are, are some of the project findings, and, and I very much welcome feedback. I, on that. So what did we try to do? Well, as I said, this project is very much an extension of my long-term interest in the local, in the everyday, and it's based on an understanding that, that situations of conflict are, are, are this co-constitution, this complex co-constitution of structure and agency in which communities and individuals are contributing um, to the conflict scape in a way. Um, yet at the same time, they have agency that tries to obviate the impact of conflict, that tries to escape the conflict. And of course, individuals are very much a victim of the conflict. But we very deliberately decided that the individual would be our base unit. And we wanted to capture the agency that individuals have. We wanted to take a phenomenological approach because we're all aware as, as researchers that, you know, people don't always tell the truth in interviews and that's absolutely fine. They have a sense of social awareness and they may not want to appear as prejudiced as they actually are. So we tried through various research methodologies to, to get the unfiltered person, the unmediated uh, opinion. And of course, that's very difficult, and I'm not entirely sure we can ever do that successfully. And we were very interested in how the micro informed the dynamic and vice versa. What actually happens in the street, in the store, in the line at, at the bakery? And all of this, as we'll see, raises questions of structure and agency. And, uh, you know, I'm increasingly convinced that both of these are very fuzzy categories that leach into to one another. OK. Um, so we worked in four locations each in Colombia, Lebanon and Northern Ireland. And when I say we worked, uh, I mean that Roddy and I took a, a back seat and our wonderful post, postdocs um, did a lot of the heavy lifting. Um, and our methodology involved a mix of daily pattern of life interviews in which we, we really want to know, you know, what do you do when you get up? Where do you go? You know, if you need milk and bread, where do you go? Show us the route that you take if you're, when you're bringing the kids to school or your daughter to ballet or, you know, whatever. Um, so we did a lot of walking interviews with, with people, which um, is a very different dynamic, this wonderful side-by-side -side dynamic in which we got people to, to walk us around their neighborhood. We engaged in mapping exercises. We got people to draw their locality. And I, I had this wonderful notion that we could have a fantastic exhibition with all of these maps, but it, there's a reason there are proper geographers out there. <laughs> these maps were fascinating but aesthetically no um but they were fascinating in the sense of what was in the maps and what was not in the maps uh, you know whether 
whether the drawing of the locality was highly securitized, whether it, it really was about checkpoints and police stations and, and that sort of thing, or whether it was a very confined map uh, geographically. Uh, we had had focus groups and we also uh, had a, a photo elicitation element in which we asked people to, if safe, to photograph their area. So from this, we've got, we are constructing a database of over 4,000 individual conflict related actions that people have engaged in, in Colombia, Northern Ireland and um, Lebanon. And these are, uh, these fall into various categories such as antagonize or moderate or teach or avoid. Um, and we wanted to examine this at the inter and the intragroup level in terms of gender and in terms of um, perceived impact. So we're developing this, this huge uh, database, which we're currently trying to tame in a, in a sense. Um, I, I find th this sort of exercise is, is very much about sense making and order making and, and sometimes that sense and that order is an imposition on on the the very wonderful awkward nature uh, of human activity so the, there's an element of artificiality there um key findings from this well you know what what i think the main finding that comes out of it um, and, and many of these findings, I guess, are obvious, but now we can say, ha ha, and I, I know I sound like a positivist, positivist here, but we can say, ha, you know, I can prove it now, you know, we've got evidence. But the key finding are these multiple forms of agency that people employ in deeply divided and conflict affected societies. People are enormously creative, enor enormously entrepreneurial in the actions they undertake. They have a deftness of thinking uh, and everyday diplomacy, this amazing repertoire of actions that, that they draw on in their everyday. It, it, it really makes us, I think, need to rethink where expertise lies. And also, you know, this phrase that, that most of us put in grant applications, capacity building, it's pretty clear they don't need capacity. We need capacity to, to be built. Um, also, the hyper-localism of these conflict-affected areas uh, really shines through in interview transcripts. It really is the case that people identify the exact spot where someone was shot. You know, it wasn't they were, they were shot on this street. It was on that piece of the sidewalk. Um, and how people have have these very intimate and complex psychogeographies of their um, of their locality, and how this is handed down, uh, how this becomes intergenerational, so that the kids who weren't even born when that person was shot at that particular point uh, off the sidewalk actually knows then uh, that that was the spot. Also, really interestingly, what comes out from the research is just the extent of anticipatory violence, the notion that something is going to happen, that violence could come back, that this is not safe. And this patterns itself into the everyday of where people live. So certainly in the case of Northern Ireland and Lebanon, it is demonstrable that intergroup, intergroup violence has dropped very significantly. Um, there is, you know, in Northern Ireland, there is virtually no intergroup um, violence. Yet, the anticipation that something bad will happen persists. And I think that's fascinating and tells us something about what we need to do in terms of peace accords, that they they offer and promise safety, but at an at a everyday ontological level, they're not delivering that. And we need to ask, you know, what is it that makes people feel unsafe in a society which demonstrably is, is safer? 
And there's something there about the intergenerational transmission of this fear of violence. Also really fascinating is the convenience of conflict, something I'm going to come back to at the very end. And it's very common for us to ask, uh, you know, whether in Belfast or Beirut or, or parts of, of Colombia, would you go to the other side of town? You know, if you needed something, would you go? And people say, yeah, of course I go. But I don't need to. Because everything that I need is here in my own single identity community. So the, in a way, and this is linked to the maintenance of conflict and the sustainability, uh, there's something about the convenience of these conflict scapes that, that have developed around communities. And those conflict scapes often are to do with convenience as much as they are to do with, um, with violence or opposition to, to the other. Um, you know, why should I go and take my kid to the school at the other side uh, of town if there's a school here? Um, and, you know, that's a very good question. Think about our own lives, which are hugely based on, on convenience most of the time. You know, we all have particular networks that, that are routes that, that we follow. Um, and uh, another key finding is, is, is the huge ability of people to simultaneously inhabit multiple life worlds. For people to simultaneously, in terms of time, to be in a life world that is clearly in the present, but looking at both the past and the future at the same time. It's a remarkable ability that humans have. Or in terms of embodiment, there's an, a wonderful quotation from one of the one of the interview transcripts from Belfast, uh, and someone reflecting on their youth, uh, and they're talking about riots, intercommunal riots. And they said, yeah, I threw the odd stone, but I mostly stayed at the back. In other words, yeah, I'll risk the body, but not very much, <laughs> you know? And th this wonderful dualism, and we see that dualism in relation to the home as well, which is a site both of safety, it's somewhere we withdraw to, but because the home is in a single um, identity area, it's also a, a source of threat. Uh, so, so there's this this wonderful ability of us as as humans to live and to enact and embody these simultaneous life worlds. So, what we found was by far the most uh, common action, conflict related action that people engage in is avoidance. As a species, we are extraordinarily good at avoidance. Um, and again, this gets back to convenience. And we uh, avoid individuals and groups and places and situations. And as part of the calcus, it becomes implicit. It becomes, in a sense, unconscious. Yes, of course, we avoid um, people who we reckon might be troublemakers or we avoid places where there might be incidents. And we all do do this in our everyday lives. You know, campuses can be small places in a way, and we need to avoid, you know, the director. You know, he he was expecting that that form or that piece of paper uh, this morning. Oh no, there's Asher. So people, you know, we all we all do that avoidance. But on campus, you know, the worst that can happen is some awkwardness. Uh, but of course, in a, in a conflict affected society, it could escalate from awkwardness to, to physical threat. And, and of course, this issue of avoidance works at the intra and the intergroup level, perhaps more at the intragroup level, because that's where people are. They're more likely to uh, engage with or see or encounter people from within their own group, because physically they, they're in their enclave. Okay. So when I put this together, Mrs. McGinty, my wife, was passing by and, and asked if I was now uh, running an advertising campaign for an IVF clinic. OK, so try to get over the unfort unfortunate imagery of the uh, of the picture. Um, but it's 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 trying to conceptualize what we've we've been seeing. So the big circle is the main conflict 
But in that, there are lots of other sub -conf conflicts which are both intergroup and intergroup. And you know, I should really animate this so that the whole thing is shaking and, and very unstable. And individuals are enacting all sorts of agency. And some of that is contributing to the conflict. And some of that is um, drawing away from the conflict. And a lot of it is, is actually not having very much effect. I, I you know, I, I, and I guess this drawing, this figure is very much a, a way of, of illustrating that I'm still trying to work this out in, in my head. But what I want to emphasize is the immense amount of agency that is out there. And not all of that agency, um, or, or I think what we have to see is that this agency a uh, denotes that individuals or creative entrepreneurial have wriggle room, managed to eke out spaces in which they they can do and say and enact and embody. Okay. So let me pivot slightly to to this issue of I'm I'm getting to this ignorance, this issue of ignorance. And we're probably all familiar with um a focus in peace and conflict studies on the issue of knowledge, particularly on local knowledge, uh, almost a, a, a sort of rediscovery over the past 20 years. Oh, you know, local people have knowledge. They, they actually know stuff. They're, they're not these helpless victims who are just sitting there twiddling their thumbs, waiting for, um, waiting for uh, saviors to come in from, from outside. So, this focus on local knowledge has been part of the, the local turn, which we've seen in the in the literature. Um, and there has been, I think, an increasing recognition of the complexities of, of knowledge, of how these are complex assemblages in which there are hierarchies in which knowledge is marbled with power. And some people have more power than others, and therefore they can say that their knowledge is um, has more legitimacy, has more authenticity, et cetera. And there's a marvelous phrase uh, of, the t of the moral techno power of, of knowledge. And we can see that, I think, in relation to a lot of international interveners who become this one-stop shop in which they identify the problem, they identify the solution, and hey, presto, they just happen to be the solution as, as well. And this is usually all wrapped up in a sort of moral coda, uh, which simplifies everything into good guys and bad guys and, you know, right and wrong. And we know that um, all societies are not as simplistic uh, as this. And there's been attempts to instrumentalize lo local knowledge. Some of these have been, I think, genuine attempts to harness local knowledge, to harness participation, and some are, are pretty shallow as well. And I think we all we all know that. So I, this issue of, of local knowledge got me uh, thinking, and it was fairly clear from our, our field work, the huge energy that people invest into local knowledge, into um, maintaining, updating the story of themselves, of their family, of their community. It takes an enormous amount of energy. It, it's almost like a, a database that people are constantly working on, you know, and you, you speak to someone who spent a day coding and they're exhausted and washed out. Well, actually, that's what people are doing in conflict affected societies. They're constantly coding, they're constantly um, uh, re-upping the, the database about their particular area, what's safe, what's not safe, who's uh, worth um, doing business with, who's not. And these complex assemblages of knowledge clearly work at the intra and the inter group level. And they're all part of this everyday situational awareness in which people are constantly intelligence gathering what's safe, what's not safe, what's permissible, what's not permissible. So it's this sort of chronic uh, activity, this necessary activity that is exhausting. It's absolutely exhausting because the conflicts that we're looking at in, in Colombia, Northern Ireland and Lebanon, these are multi-generational conflicts that have been going on for, for decades in which, you know, a new generation is freighted with the knowledge uh, 
that has been passed on to them from a previous generation. Um, but all of this interest in knowledge got me thinking about ignorance. And I'm aware, I, I mean, every day is a school day. And I thought, oh, ignorance. No one's really worked on, on ignorance uh, until I found out that there was a Rutledge handbook on ignorance studies. And apparently it's a big thing in economics and it's a big thing in, um, in sociology. Uh, so, uh, but as far as I know, people have not, uh, there, there is writing on ignorance in relation to conflict uh, and, and peace, but, but not a, a typology of that. And I think it's possible to disaggregate between different types of ignorance, between the unconscious memory lapses and lack of knowledge on the one hand, and deliberately deployed ignorance. And that's the bit that got me. That's the bit that I thought, oh, that's interesting. So if, if you conduct interview research and you then read over the transcript, it's remarkable how interviews are full of, I don't know, mm, I forget, I, I really don't remember. Oh, you need to ask my brother about that. It's really remarkable, particularly with these long running conflicts. There's a good deal of of ignorance in 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 our daily pattern of of speech, but that's the unconscious um, sort of of memory lapse. Um, and I, you know, I'm I'm conscious that I'm in the same room as Madaf, who puts together very sophisticated figures and graphs and all of the rest. So I apologize for for the crude nature of of this. But what's in so this are, are different types. Merely, it's not frequency. It's merely different types of ignorance that we find um, in our data. So there will be other types of ignorance in conflict affected uh, areas, but these are the types that we have found in our research. So clearly, poor memory, but also you know kids are of a different generation and they they don't want mom and dad's conflict or the grandparents' conflict. They're just not not interested and they make a conscious decision that this stuff isn't for me. Or what we find quite often is incorrect group identification. So if you come from a conflict affected area, you pride yourself in sort of knowing the out group. You can tell, yeah, they're a Protestant or they're Sunni. And what comes up in some of the interview transcripts is that people get it wrong. They misidentify and, you know, they, they think they're talking to someone in the in group, but actually that person's in the out group or the huge ignorance of out group circumstances because people live in enclaves, because people live uh, separate lives just in the in group, then in that vacuum, there is ignorance. There is a lack of knowledge about the out group, about, you know, the activities they engage in or their economic uh, circumstances or the ignorance of being duped by armed groups. Uh, and one thing that, that is quite remarkable, certainly on my travels, is the lack of interest that people in conflict affected areas have in other conflict affected areas. I remember, oh dear, I remember two decades ago bringing a group of Afghans around Northern Ireland and we brought them to, to meet with political leaders, with government leaders, with NGOs, and never once did anyone ask the Afghans, what's going on in Afghanistan? And, you know, these people were coming from the most interesting place on the planet. Um, so there is an insularity. Uh, and also there can be sort of weird conspiracy theories floating around about, you know, there are unseen forces manipulating the conflict. So what's significant about all of this is this is unconscious or most of these are unconscious types of ignorance or, or not knowing. But then contrast this with these types of ignorance, which are all conscious, which are all deliberately deployed. And that's what I mean about this creativity, this entrepreneurialism, this repertoire of, um, a, 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 of social practices. So we have things such as 
um, don't share information with family members to avoid hassle or to protect them. So, for example, if you're in some parts of Colombia and you work as a human rights defender, it might be better if mom and dad don't know for their own safety, for their own comfort. I, that's a deliberately deployed sort of ignorance. Um, a very common one, uh, you pretend to know nothing. Uh, you didn't see it uh, because it's easier that way. You don't want to get into trouble. Uh, again, the kids not being interested or a vagueness about identity to the out group. Um, we've, you know, we all go to Starbucks. Uh, they ask the name, they write it on, on the mug. In particular times in Belfast, if your name is identified as one group or another, you're going to be John. Everybody's John, you know? You're, you're going to signal a vagueness about your identity, that you're not in one group or another group. Or parents uh, deliberately don't indoctrinate their kids or they don't um, share a particular partisan or partial history of the conflict or the parties claim ignorance to individuals would claim ignorance. You know, I didn't hear that. I didn't see that. No, that's news to me. To really avoid the awkwardness that a particular type of knowledge of an incident might, uh, might bring in an intergroup institution. So the, the key point, this isn't a huge revelation, but it was for me every day as a school day, just this amazing, wonderful repertoire of, um, of ignorance and how, in a sense, ignorance, which often is, is associated with not knowing, with not educating oneself, with you know, not making the effort to find out is actually a key piece of agency, a key uh, piece of our repertoire. Um, so coming to an end, uh, from the project, I think that uh, we, as a, as a community of practice, as, a, as an area of study, I think it'd be good if we can pay more attention to these forms of agency and identify some of them as actual as actually forms of power. Um, that this these forms of immaterial power are uh, important, but they're also signaling something uh, as well. Um, also, I think it's very useful to think about the sustainability of conflict. And this is where I come back to this convenience issue. It's more inconvenient to make that final push to peace. It's more awkward. It will involve upset. It will involve upset to family life, to where we live, to how we make our living. So there's something about the convenience of conflict and the need to disrupt that, but disrupt it in a, in a way that doesn't disrupt the normal pattern of life that people have uh, identified or, or, or worked out in many societies. And that, of course, is an incredibly difficult place for us as a community of practice to be. Hence my two cheers for ignorance, or indeed what I'm saying is two cheers for negative peace. And all of us in this room want to be in a, in a position where we, we can see positive peace, but maybe we have to bank negative peace first and recognize what it brings to us. But on saying that, that's loaded with all sorts of, of ethical and practical problems. So that brings us to a, a uncomfortable place. Um, so yeah, I've covered the ignorance thing, the knowledge uh, thing, I, I, but then finally, I, and I really will end here, is I think as a, as a discipline and community of practice, we're actually quite good at identifying precipitants of escalation. We, we're, we're quite good at working out when conflicts are going to escalate. And there are all sorts of indicators and signals for that. I'm not entirely sure that we've unpacked non-escalation enough. Because what our research is, is saying is that the vast majority of activities that people engage in, in conflict-affected activities, conflict-affected contexts, are non-escalatory. 
Now that tells us something about the comfort of conflict, but also the cost of conflict so that people know that if they escalate, well, there will be cost and blowback. And there's something else as well. And if you think about, and I'm, I'm very indebted to Roddy Brett for this line of thinking, if you think about particularly Lebanon and Northern Ireland, well, the armed actors have largely stepped back. They're still there. They still have a presence either in actual fact, in the, in the case of Hezbollah in, in, in Lebanon, but in, in folk memory, certainly in Northern Ireland, they have stepped back, but the conflict has retained its shape. So there's something odd going on, and it's worth asking if communities are, the, are those factors that are holding the conflict in shape because of this holding pattern of non-escalation. OK, so let me finish by saying that this is very much thinking in, in progress. So comments and, and uh, questions are, are incredibly welcome. Thank you. Thank you so much, Roger. Thank you very much for your um, for this presentation. So very so interesting. We have like around forty minutes for questions and answers of the public. We generally at the Croft Institute we try to give uh, students the possibility to ask questions first. But well, I find out to my horror that some <laughs> some students are here because they're getting credit. Uh, rather than really, really wanting to be here. So those are the students that I really want to hear from. You know, the sort of, can you repeat the entire thing? I wasn't listening. Absolutely, yes. But if you want to keep going. Let me do it, please, at the back. Yeah, thank you. Um, amazing, amazing uh, presentation. And, and I'll... I'll... I would, um, as much as possible, limit my question to um, this very, I think, important um, point about ignorance as um, a significant trope. In fact, as you said, a key piece of agency. And so just holding on ignorance and agency together and how apparently contradictory it is, but really um, how how much it um, it's, um, unveils. And I... I want to speak about um, as a question this bifurcation and pardon my use of the word between the conscious and the unconscious, especially at the site of ignorance and how strategies that become embodied in conflict affected areas, for example, become some kind of habitual memory, right? That um, people do, people perform in conflict affected areas not necessarily consciously or unconsciously, but because they have become part and parcel of like habitual memory because they have been embodied. So how does that um, like enrich or complicate the bifurcation between the conscious and the unconscious and further even narrate a performed ignorance as um, a kind of agency? So that'll be uh, my question. Thank you. Do, do we take a group or do we? Okay. Yeah, let, let me res respond. I, I, I like this, this notion of, of performed ignorance and will steal that. Thank you. Um, I, I'm not a social psychologist, but it, it strikes me that, that what's interesting is this blending of a, the conscious and the unconscious and how you know, as you say, this performativity is uh, enacted over decades uh, in the same place. And there is a sort of, there's something quite interesting about the expectations that each of the parties has of the other. And, you know, as someone who doesn't live in this landmass, let me give you an example. When I come to this landmass, I'm usually going to university towns or, or cities and I go to a, a diner or a restaurant and I often order the most unhealthy thing on the, on the menu. And the waiting staff were always uh, students and they're extraordinarily, you know, lithe and sporty and all of the rest. And I order this burger 
with you know all, everything and they say great choice that's my favorite this is a person who's never eaten a trans fat in their life <laughs> They're lying. I know they're lying. They know that I know they're lying, but we're all in on the game. And I think in, you know, and, and that's a, that's a non-contentious social situation. But I think in deeply divided societies, there is this performativity, this ritualized politeness in which people um, conform to expected roles to almost scripted roles, although the, the script isn't written, but the script is known. Um, and there's something there about how we unconsciously lapse into that script because it's a safe place, because it will get us, it will obviate any awkwardness, it will um, maintain good relations, and both parties can walk, walk away. Um, you know, there's a, a saying from Northern Ireland from the, the poet Seamus Heaney, whatever you say, say nothing, which means that people talk incessantly about the weather, but not the elephant in, in the room. So, yeah, uh, thank you for the question. Um, ben, please. Thank you. And uh, thank you very much for a super interesting presentation and a lot to think about. I, I wondered in, in this uh, sort of really detailed rich data set that, that you've collected across the three countries um if there are any clues or insights or any reflections you have as to who chooses these strategies of ignorance because that's especially for the conscious ignorance it seems to me that's what they are they're, they're strategies um of, of non-escalation as you said um because uh, just reflecting anecdotally on my own experience of living in conflict affected contexts there are some people who do choose these strategies more than others, right? And and the the difference in that choice can contribute to some of the intra-group tension um, as to you know who is performing their ignorance and who isn't. Um, and so I wondered if you had any any reflections on 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 that aspect. Okay. Uh, maybe I'll I'll take another question, which is the strategy of someone who is trying desperately to think of the answer to the current question. The, the someone at the front, please. Okay, thank you. Uh, fantastic. Uh, thank you for the presentation. I am a STEM entrepreneurship student, so there will be a lot of things that I, I was Googling as you were speaking. So uh, you mentioned something about uh, psychogeography, and I was a bit curious about that because I was familiar with, I'm familiar with epigenetics, and you said it's important to spot exactly where people are shot. And I wanted to understand that more, if you could elaborate on that. And additionally, how does avoidance or arrogance, uh, sorry, ignorance affect good entrepreneurship? Thank you. Okay. Um, yeah. uh, ben, who, who chooses um, to deploy these particular social practices, uh, like ignorance, but, but like avoidance and, and, and others? Um, we, the nature of the research was we, we, we really wanted to, uh, to focus on individuals. We wanted to focus on daily pattern of life and therefore people give us quite, a uh, everyday, highly local, um, views. So they, there wasn't because of the way, because of what we were trying to get at, we didn't ask many questions about, um, you know, elite level politics about party leaders that came up. So it was pretty clear that families are absolutely crucial in all, in all of this. And family in many ways is the most important political party any of us will ever be a member of because that's where most of us or many of us get our political compass and our, our moral compass. So it, it was very clear in a lot of these uh, daily pattern of life histories or, 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 or um, a interview transcripts, the extent to which the family, you know, a family member did that and others followed suit. Um, so, or the extent to which it was highly localized. So if people were living in a, in a housing project, I, 
there were these sort of charismatic individuals who operated at a layer below formally organized civil society. They weren't civil society organizations. They were civil society. There's an important difference. Um, and they were, in a sense, de facto or informal community leaders. They were people who, um, who took bold moves, either escalatory or, or, or de-escalatory, and others followed suit. So there were these sort of big characters in a way, and you know, and we all know that in in our everyday lives. So those were the were were the um, in a sense the the notable characters in 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 these stories, but also very clearly, all of this is marbled with intersectionality. Gender and class and ability or disability really matter in all of this, in which. You know the middle classes can buy themselves out of an enclave into a nicer enclave, a gated community, um, or, or uh, issues of gender meant that encounter and indeed the expectation, the social expectations attached to particular uh, genders were were very noticeable. Um, I just have to remind myself of of your question that. The issue, the issue of psychogeography, I, I think, is particularly pertinent because of the role of identity in these societies in which people uh, identify very strongly with their community and their community identifies very strongly with a particular um, set of streets or a particular village. And this was highly localized. Um, which other research, the, the everyday peace indicators research that I've, I've conducted also confirms that the people often think in very much in terms of the immediate vicinity of the home, you know, actually quite a quite a small neighborhood rather than an extensive one. And what was also noticeable is that these psychogeographies or intergenerational or passed on. There's a wonderful scene. I don't know if anyone has seen it's on Netflix. It's called Derry Girls. It's it purports to be fiction. It's not. It's a documentary. Okay. It, it is utterly, utterly true to life. Even I actually lived in Derry at the time it's set. And it, you know, down to the hairstyles of the girls. But anyway, it, it's 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 a comedy in Northern Ireland uh, about four teenage girls and and a boy, and you know there a lot of sort of growing up stories. But there's a scene in which the mother of one of the girls shouts at her teenage daughter about her very messy bedroom, and she says it's like Beirut up there. And that's fascinating to me, and it goes back to the psychogeography that you know the civil war in in Beirut ended probably one and a half generations ago, yet Beirut has become this byword of, of war and mess. And, you know, and the city is not in a good place uh, at the minute with its port blasts and all sorts of economic instability and all sorts of things. But it's amazing how the reputation of that one place has, has continued. Um, so these cycle geographies, these belief systems that are associated with territory ha have long legs. Uh, they, they, they last very long. Um, sorry, the question about good entrepreneurship. By entrepreneurship, I, I, I don't mean economic entrepreneurship. I mean social entrepreneurs. I mean people with um, or people who are creative, people who take risks, these self-starters, these broad-shouldered individuals who can take um, criticism from their own side, but also from others that, you know, and we know them all in our, in our own lives, you know, these people who set up clubs and societies, the, the people who, who are change makers in societies. Um, so that's the, if I misunderstood what, what, what you meant, that was the sort of person I was, I was talking about. And those sorts of people are going to have all of the emotional intelligence that allows them to uh, deploy ignorance at one moment, but be super bright and super smart uh, at another moment. Yeah.
Hi, right, thank you for your presentation. I am reading from my exams on ignorance, so very excited about this topic as well. I'm wondering if in your data, as you have it now, if you have a little bit more information about the practice or performance of ignorance of when it is, um, of how can it be or not be violent in particular context, if you have seen that. And maybe that's also a little bit goes into Ben's question of who practices it, but more interested in this, uh, the practice or performance of ignorance, how does power affect it or not in your particular um, situations? Um, and the other question I have is, uh, is this salient in people's conceptions about themselves or subjectivities or identity formation in the data that you have now? Mm. So a very good question. The, the um, question about power and ignorance is, is very important and very, very interesting because, you know, different individuals, different communities will have, have different levels of power at their disposal, but also different types of power. So some people might have more material power than immaterial power or, or vice versa. You know, there are plenty of cases of willful ignorance, you know, the, 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 the uh, you know, and we, we see this in many conflict affected uh, societies in which some individuals deny um, rights or, or, or indeed a, a sense of identity to, to others. And, and that's clearly the mobilization of ignorance in a, in a very escalatory and, and uh, willful way. Plenty of examples of 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 that, I'm afraid, um, in which it's it's consciously deployed. But but what interested me was that there are quite a few examples where it's non-escalatory, and and that to me that you know I hadn't thought about that before. Um, and and then the extent to which people are are sort of conscious of its of its salience. This is one of those things that has struck me after we've concluded the data gathering. And I'd, you know, I would love to go back and say, you know who you said you don't know or you don't remember? Did you really not know? And did you really not remember? Or are you just telling me that? <laughs> I, so it, it's a genuine, um, I'm not sure, uh, answer uh, to that. I think that so much of this actually is unconscious, but um lots of it as I, as I hope to to have shown is conscious and and in a sense salient as part of people's navigation through the awkwardness of everyday life what's the thing no actually unless there is a student here behind i have many questions I'll ask. <laughs> I'll ask uh, two uh, questions or comment. One, one uh, first is uh, you mentioned the issue of maps. It remind me of research that I know of with regards to Israel Palestine, where Israelis and Palestinians were asked to draw a map of the land, and they drew mental maps that had no relations to reality. But I wonder if you can share with us some of. This because I find it really, really intriguing how people draw the space that really is not connected with the the reality of the space. And the other is a, I guess it's a sort of a methodological question that probably you have been asked many times before about the what I see as the possibility of a tension between the focus on the local and the everyday and the generalability of it. Uh, so these are my but first two. Is that the question? <laughs> it's a question mark at the end. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> that solves it. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you so much, uh, Roger. You know, since I've had the the pleasure of reading the project proposal, I was wondering if you wanted to share with us a little bit about your insights on reconciliation and the idea of 
how do we move or is there a link between non-escalation and reconciliation um and i'm thinking very much about some of the findings that you shared with us a couple of months ago in Bristol when you were saying um, you know that this agency is also an agency that builds peace in many different ways and of course that it's just a matter also for us as academics or scholars and practitioners to have the ability to recognize that local knowledge and the local building of peace beyond beyond our conceptual lenses that seem so inadequate to recognize what is actually happening at the local level. Thank you. Thanks. Um, the, the, the map issue uh, is, um, it, it's fascinating the variety in which, uh, the variety and the quality of, of the maps was, was fascinating, but a, a couple of things came out of them. One is um, how localized they were, uh, and you know we because we asked people about the everyday, then they were quite localized. But they, you know, no one drew a map of Lebanon, and then this is my town in it. It was this is my town, or this is my village, or this is my um, you know the few streets. It was. Um, I think it was quite revealing about how we live lives according to particular routes. Uh, you know, all of us do that, but how many of these routes were routes of avoidance um, in particular places. So people took, you know, these weird elongated routes, you know, the nearest shop was here or store was here to get milk or bread, but they traveled tr twice the distance because they, they didn't want to go to an area controlled by the out group so so the maps were were distorted um as indeed you know our, our own geographies are distorted and you know when you think about it a you know in 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 many in many cities on this land mass people would live in the city but never go to a particular area because you know they don't live there they don't know anyone there Yeah, um, in terms, we we used it, it, its main role was actually as a prompt for interviews because people, either interviews or focus groups, because people draw it and then we asked them to annotate, to, to narrate. So that was his main focus. We, As I said at, at the beginning, I thought they would be aesthetically pleasing, but it's as though I did them. You know, they're really not... Um, uh, so that was their main purpose, actually, and it it worked particularly well because people then had to had to explain these anomalies about what you know the center of town was here, but actually they you know they did a lot of their business or they sent their school there, and people were were very pleased. It, it was such a good prompt. People were very pleased when you asked questions. Uh, you know why is you know, why is the biggest building in the town the military barracks or or the police station, you know, rather than demonstrably the biggest building, which is the town hall or a, a block of flats? So it was it it mainly was was a prompt and and there's something, and I've noticed it over many, many years, there is something quite amazing when you give fully grown adults large pieces of paper and marker pens. And it 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 opens up a new research space. Um, the, the question, uh, the, the statement that you judiciously put a, a question mark at the end of. Um, so, and it's, it's a great question. I, and it, it is, what, what does the study of the local and the everyday and the hyper local tell us about a wider um wider scales and it's certainly with everyday peace indicators which began life in in this building is the question that we're asked uh, very frequently in which people say well you know great your research tells us about that tiny little spot in the planet 
but what does it tell us about the wider society? And uh, I mean, I think that this, you know, to, to positivists, the answer is probably very little because, you know, you you want to do a much wider randomized controlled trial or, or, or something. But uh, with things like everyday peace indicators in the city of, of Mostar, um, we have repeated our exercise in seven districts and there are 21 districts. And, you know, we hope we can generalize from that. But it raises these important questions about structure and agency it, and the extent to which individuals are, uh, in a sense, victims of or pawns of their own, uh, of the structures they find themselves in or their co-constitutive of it. And I think that um, there are always going to be these localized peculiarities. But if you then, with the data set, put them into categories, well, then those categories are, are, are quite broad enough that actually this action that we find in a town in Colombia is, is very similar to one that we find in, in Northern Ireland etc so by you know by building a, a code book in a way is a very uncomfortable act of playing god and and sense making but that's where you can see patterns that that factor up and just to finish uh, that answer one thing that i i've i've sort of noticed and i i've learned very much from john paul lederach on this who obviously has a has a great history here is the policy world obsession with factoring up. And actually, I think the real story we need to be looking at is factoring out because so much non-escalatory and de-escalatory activity is imitative, happens uh, horizontally. And that, in a sense, is what, in a way, I, I think de-escalates or, or, or spreads non-escalation the danger is that things that work at the hyper local level, if they are are modeled and factored up, they lose the very organic qualities that made them work in the first place. Um, so I think we can tell a lot about about the local, but with lots of of caveats. Um, I, the, this question on on non escalation and 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 what it might tell us about about reconciliation. I, I mean, my my first response is I find reconciliation such a slippery concept uh, that, you know, people have been working on it on for many decades, yet it 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 seems to be one. And, you know, it these are extraordinarily bright people just like yourself. Maybe it is just very slippery and maybe that's the way it is. You know, and we're not going to find this perfect definition and perfect root way to it because, as we know, social contexts are, are incredibly dynamic and, um, you know, everything is a moving target. But one thing strikes me, and that is if, you know, if you look around this society or, you know, Switzerland or Sweden or or whatever, societies that in our literature are not necessarily linked with conflict. Scratch the surface, and I don't need to tell you about the toxicity of, of politics in, in this society. I don't need to tell you about the vast um, conflict, uh, about the, you know, the, the inequalities, etc. But, you know, Sweden with the hollowing out of the welfare state and um, a actually quite significant gang violence. And I wonder you know, if we think about root ways to reconciliation or root ways to living better together or root ways to, to something towards positive peace, it's worth reminding ourselves about societies like this or, or Canada or, or, or Norway or whatever and asking, is this as good as it gets? In a sense, there is a, there is a limit because we do live in a world with competitive individuals. We do live in a world with climate crisis. We do live in, in a world um, in, in which you know big corporations have have a lot of sway. So it's I think it's worth tempering or or quest in, in a way 
and wondering, you know, even if we have non-escalation, even if we have programs towards reconciliation, we're still going to have uh, very aggressive forms of capitalism. We're going to have um, a climate crisis, et cetera. So I, I, I think that's a debate that, that we haven't quite had in our field, because if our starting point for a debate is reconciliation, we need, I think we need to temper those, those debates. Yeah. Please. Uh, thank you for your presentation and uh, answering these questions. I would like to perhaps ask a question, a follow-up question on the escalating effects of avoidance and ignorance. One of the uh, bar plots that you showed also uh, pinpointed how negotiation is another form of agency. And I wonder under which circumstances people choose or prefer negotiation over ignorance or avoidance in places where, you know, armed actors are uh, in competition for territorial control and where these unspoken scripts are no longer really at disposal and perhaps uh, more uh, sort of confrontation in the form of negotiation is needed. And also, uh, uh, perhaps you can elaborate more on how uh, these different uh, forms of agency, particularly negotiation and ignorance, have different discalating effects in those contexts. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much for this talk. Um, I just had a follow-up point on something you just touched on, and it's very basic, but how do you decide when something, an action, is a form of agency? What are sort of the parameters for deciding whether that's agency or just something that someone has done? Um, so thank you. I, great. Um, really good question about, about negotiation. When do people decide? Well, the, I think a key point is that often there are situations in, in which people don't have agency. They, they don't have a choice. If you're in a particular barrio in, in Colombia and you need to go to the one next door to because the pharmacy is there, you have to negotiate uh, with, with quite literally the gatekeepers um, to to go there, so it it depends very much on what level of power, on circumstances. You know, the, this is a very moving, um, a very dynamic consequence or, or 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 set of consequences. But I think what what is needed for all forms of agency, or certainly pro pro, pro social and pro peace, is a minimum level of security. I that allows people physically to, to leave their homes, that allows people to um, think that actually, if I did engage in negotiation with quite literally a gatekeeper, that they would listen to me and might acquiesce to, to my wish to, to, to cross a, a boundary. And I think that that recognition of the importance of a minimum level of security leads us to to something that, that I think the practitioner and policy world uh, has struggled with, and that is violence reduction after peace accords. All of these, you know, these three countries have had major peace accords, but insecurity and precarity, and, and certainly in the case of, of Colombia, violence continues. So, you know, the unsatisfactory answer is it depends, and it depends very much on, on power relations at that particular moment. Those power relations are going to be gendered. They're going to uh, uh, be, be, be linked to material factors, etc. Um, yeah, how do we work out what what's the agency? We um, it's a really great question, and one of the things that I've really enjoyed about this project is that Roddy and I wrote the research proposal, and then we hired two super bright postdoctoral researchers who said, "What were you thinking?" Um, sort of said this this won't work or what you know that, that was complete rubbish and all of the rest and we had we, we genuinely had these these really fantastic project meetings 
in which we, um, and they all had to happen in the afternoon, I'll say, because Roddy was here and asleep in the mornings <laughs> when we were in Europe. But so we had lots of debates, including um, what do we mean by agency? And uh, it, it, it had to be some form of action or speech related to the conflict for us to pick it up on, on the database. And we had, we had a big debate about whether identity was a form of agency, because, you know, in deeply divided societies, people are either have and enact an identity or it's sort of given to them, sort of um, placed upon them. So we had a big debate on whether or not to include identity. And we also had a big debate on stance, the particular way, which is somewhere between identity and action. You know, the stance that that someone takes, you know, not necessarily the physical stance, but I mean, their thinking. Um, so we, to make this manageable, we narrowed it to actions, which included forms of communication, um, speech acts, uh, gestures, et cetera. Yeah. Well, thank you very much. Um, if I may ask, well, first of all, one of the things I always loved about everyday peace is that it seems to have such a wide range of applicability, right? It really gets us down to the to the to the micro level in divided societies, but yes, but in principle, not only in divided societies. And the, some of the examples you brought, Sweden, and also your own example from from ordering here the 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 food, makes me curious. What do you think changes in these type of behaviors under those situations when the the, the divides and the trenches are so deep and the stakes so high. Are those the same? The, the, the same practices we also find in, in non-divided societies, just with higher stakes? Or is there something that's unique about the, these type of conflict situations that we don't normally find in, in our everyday behaviors when ordering food at Notre Dame? Uh, thank you. I, I want to pick up on this. Um, Roger, thank you for your fascinating presentation. My question is similar to Norbert's, and it's really about scope condition here. When you talk about a conflict-affected society, what is that thing? You, you've used as a synonym, deeply divided. And then Sweden clearly is not part of, it doesn't fall within the scope of your, your idea of a conflict affected society but surely it does surely it depends on who you are it depends on your identity and your group so if we were to look at the town that we're sitting in right now south bend is this a conflict society conflict affected society surely it is for lots of people not for everyone necessarily so what delineates the conflict affected society it seems from your choice of cases you're looking at post armed conflict or post violent conflict maybe a decade or two decades after the signing of some kind of peace agreement. Is that the focus of this or does it go broader? Mm -hmm. Thanks, Julie. Thank you. Um, I've been thinking about sort of the spectrums that are implicated here. You've mentioned the agency to structure, but also inherently the kind of micro onwards to meso and maybe to macro. And I was struck by your differentiation of civil society and civil society organizations, which is a clear differentialization. But I'm also thinking about how people in their everyday life institutionalize, whether that's um, consciously of joining a you know, particular group or profession even, or unconsciously in just the ways that they have to interact with the world. Um, so I'm wondering just how those things tie in together, if these sort of same acts of agency are enacted in their more institutional roles that actually kind of enforce the structure of the societies that they're within. Um, so I'm wondering if that kind of came out in your data as well, kind of these dual identities and thinking specifically about the kind of structural elements of Belfast and defensive architecture and just the ways that like the city was built sort of for these types, like to limit agency, I guess. Um, so I'm just wondering if you can kind of 
yeah, speak to where and if that line can be drawn between sort of micro and, and further up the line. Good. Uh, thank you. Um, the, the, so the question on, in a sense, what changes, what, what, uh, um, what's the difference between these social practices in a society like this and, and in, in one under uh, greater stress? I think a lot changes, uh, you know, as you say, the stakes become higher. Um, there is a retreat into in-group activity. A, we see the rise of agitators, people who 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 can profit in terms of ego, in terms of of stature, by um, uh, their agitation. But fundamentally, we see violence. I think that's the, the the trigger point, and we move from a situation of mild awkwardness, which you might have in in South Bend, to um, a situ to a situation in which life and limb is is threatened. And, and that becomes this vicious circle with, with escalation. And it's not as though it affects one part of life, it affects all parts of, of life, uh, you know, from, from mental health right tr through to livelihood and, and, you know, decisions on, on schooling, et cetera. So it becomes all encompassing and, and um, concentrated. Laurie, your, your question, I think, is it, I think we all struggle with terminology. Uh, you know, uh, I'm not comfortable with with virtually all forms of ter terminology that that we that we have. You're you're precisely right. We're looking at post accord uh, societies about you know, 10, 25 years out. They they had violent conflicts, but at the same time, you know. There's a lot of our language that, that we use as a shorthand to move on, but actually it's not accurate. You know, so post-conflict, you know, uh, places aren't post-conflict. But even this term post, um, you know, when does a society stop being a post-conflict society and become a society? And in our own research and my use of this term, or if I go to Bosnia and, and start an interview by saying I'm interested in you know, how communities get on in post-conflict uh, Bosnia. Uh, am I reinforcing the very conflictness of that society by calling it a post-conflict society? So I, I think, you know, you're precisely right. Those are the sorts of conflicts that, that we're looking at. But even this term post-accord is now in a sense out of date because we're we're living in an era with very few comprehensive peace accords. Um, you know, we, we're not getting those big peace accords anymore, and therefore, um, I, therefore, you know, it, it, will this term fall out of out of fashion? But it, it's a point that is is well taken, and I you know I use these as, as a shorthand, but they're not satisfactory. Um, Ju Julie, you're a very good question on, um, you know, and again, I think it, it it gets back to the structure and agency issue. One, and this is a binary, and okay, binaries are, you know, far too too restrictive. But it, it strikes me that that there is a balance that people are caught in a balance between constraint and restraint in these societies, and. Um, Constraint is often the disciplining power that structure enforces on people. They're constrained by social convention. They're constrained by armed groups or, or the security forces and, and the disciplining effect that they, they can have. And what, what seems to be key in all of this is the spaces of restraint that people can find. And that's a form of agency. Um, and it's a form of power and a form of control, because often we're unrestrained. Emotions are are so high, or there's an expectation that we perform a role for our community, uh, that 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 we have to be consciously unrestrained in a way. So, in a sense, I see 
the ability to use restraint as an immense form of power, which gets us back, I think, to this structure and the agency thing and how agency can push back sometimes at structure and form uh, or help co-constitute those structures. 